Hi, Ian. Hi, Brenda. How are you? Good. I Good. can see. I can you see me? I can see you fine now. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our chat with the wonderful, the bubbly, the very talented, the exuberant, the amazing Ian Finelli. I thought you were going to say somebody else then. <laughs> <laughs> We couldn't get that other person, so Ian Fenley's turned up instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. So uh, if you haven't met Ian before, Ian is a very talented and wonderful and generous a UK-based urban sketcher and an artist and an uh, educator in the British school system. And he has a huge body of work and online classes. And um, everybody loves Ian. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> so, most <laughs> Everybody loves Ian. So, how are you doing, Ian? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Yeah, despite good. despite the way the world has has turned on us, I'm I'm kind of okay. I'm just looking yeah. out for I'm just looking out for people in the local community. Really, that's all we can do. I think the whole you know the whole world is just turned upside down. We're yeah, all we can do is look out for each other. Yeah, and, and know, it happened very own. suddenly too, didn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I had all these amazing trips. One of which was with you guys to. Um, Texas, which was due to be on, on Monday, and it's, that's obviously been cancelled. And then all the other ones that are, are due to go out over the course of the next few months have all been cancelled. And I just don't know when it's when it's going to end. But when it does, when it is over, we will all be back with a vengeance. Yeah, we will. We'll need to connect back together again and, and just make our, you know, create dreams on location. Yeah. That's right. So, Ian, let's talk about colour and line. Okay. I have to say, when I watch you do your work, when I've watched you make your, your art, uh, and you put the color on before the line, which is quite unusual, not a lot of people do it that way, yeah. and I've seen you, you know, put your color on over top of some basic lines, and I thought to myself every time, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> he's ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> but it always comes back. So tell me about your thinking about color. Okay. Can I show a picture? Let, yeah. Let, let me show you a picture because it's always so much easier to explain with a picture. Okay. So this this is um, this is in Amsterdam, and this was done last last summer on location. Okay. So you can kind of see that the drawing, the kind of the perspective, the composition, the content is all it's all quite realistic. And, and that's obviously to do with what you can see in front of you and it's the observational side. But when it can, kind of comes to the colour, you kind of want to go a little bit beyond purely what you can see. And you want to kind of express how you feel and how you feel at that moment and your kind of experience of being there and, and the memories and, and just the emotional side of, you know, you being on location as an artist, as a human being sitting in front of this motif. So that's where the colour comes in. The colour kind of expresses a bit about you. So the actual drawing, the composition, is very much about what's the thing in front of you, and that's controlling, I guess, what you're recording. You know, because if it's a bridge, it's going to be a bridge. You know, you can't turn it into an elephant. But the colour is the thing that you can control because you know you feel colour, you see colour different from anybody else. So the colour is almost like your personal signature. So the colour can be referenced in, for example, this this blue here, kind of references the blue underneath the bridge of the water. That brickwork obviously wasn't pink, but I wanted it to be pink because then the pink just makes the blue more interesting and then they start to play. So they have a life of their own. They're kind of almost like independent from you. You let them come out to play and express themselves and say something. And that's probably more to do with, with art and creativity and emotion than it is to do with urban sketching. But I'd like to think that my urban sketching is just the starting point. I have a question. So, um, are you thinking about a color palette when you put the you choose your colors? Uh, are you thinking about which colors look good together? No, I just make it up as I go along. <laughs> Honestly, I do. This was in this was in um, Bari last last summer on a fantastic trip that I did. And this was like a little square just around the back on the side streets with all the kind of the washing and the vesper and the cracks and the cobbles and all the satellite dishes. So 
the, you, it's a very intuitive way of working and it's kind of hard to explain but if someone came on a workshop they'd kind of get what i'm doing because it's all just done bit by bit by bit by bit and there is a color journey but i'm not i'm not mindful of colors working together and harmonizing i just literally chuck it all on if it doesn't work well it doesn't work but most of the time it kind of does work <laughs> and sometimes sometimes i honestly don't know why <laughs> but it just does and Going back to your original question, is the, the kind of the line and the colour are very much in harmony with each other. This is my latest one, and this kind of taps into what we've just been talking about, about, you know, obviously a lot of us are in kind of like isolation or social distancing or, or lockdown or whatever it is at the moment. So instead of doing a tour of Texas, I'm doing a tour of my house, which I've lived in for years. So I feel like I know every nook and cranny. But these pictures are just allowing me to kind of revisit things and notice things all over again. So with this one, the line work, the perspective has to be quite tight, it has to be accurate, it has to be kind of, you know, the way it really is. But then the colour, you can just kind of invest your feeling into it, your emotion, you know, your response to what's there and how it's all going. Whether it's feeling claustrophobic or, you know, completely pissed off about the whole situation or just, you know, thankful that you're able to make art and you can make art out of what's in front of you. So yeah, the colour is a really big, a big part. Yeah, do you, do you want me to do a little bit of painting? Do you want yeah. me to do a little painting yeah. demonstration? Okay, so I'll do, if I just tilt that forward a little bit. Okay, so I'm just going to work on this piece of paper here. So these are my paints, okay? These are my brushes. I've got a whole range of brushes. I've got my big pastry brush. I've got my medium sized pastry brush. I've got my two kind of round headed ones that I hardly ever use, but I just have them with me because it makes me look like a really proper artist, but I never use them. And then I've got my riggers and I use these guys all the time because they're basically just, just pens. Okay. So first thing I do is just wet the paints. Wake them up because they're a bit sleepy these guys, they've not been used since yesterday. And then I often start off with a pastry brush and just literally whack it in the colour. Can you see that? Just stick it in like that. And then I hold the brush right at the very tip, like that. And I often just drag it across. And then often I just hold it really lightly and it just drags its way across the page to put like a wash down. And then you can stick other colours on top and just let them play. Just really let them play together. And you're not just thinking about complementary colours or anything like that? Well, I suppose, I suppose I do instinctively. It's a very, I mean, I've been painting for, you know, a long, long time and I've painted thousands of pictures and I don't really worry about it too much. I mean, I suppose they are complementary in a subconscious kind of way, but often it's do what's in front of me, you know, so the starting point, so for example, I've just, I've just stuck on um, a cerulean blue there and a burnt sienna. So for example, if I was painting a bridge scene or something, those two colours might actually reference what's in front of me. So often often it's it's to do with the colours you can see that are actually there that you're trying to you're trying to replicate. Like in, in this one here, that building was actually that colour. Right. And that building was probably that colour. That building was probably a type of creamy yellow, but I've exaggerated it. That canopy probably was that kind of lovely rose pink. So a lot of the colours are accurate but then other colors are there to make the picture work and to bring out the best of these colors so i suppose in some ways it is complementary you've got your warm and your cold you've got your coming forward you've got your pushing back but i often kind of just play around with it really you know i like to kind of make things not as straightforward as possible i like to kind of keep it interesting for me yeah i like my yeah. interest in it to be there sort of all the time really Jennifer is asking, how do you decide where to leave the white? <clears throat> That's such a great question. Brilliant question. Right. Let me find. Because the best way to answer all of these is just really by showing examples. So I know me... even I asked you that something similar uh, once, and that is, uh, what about painting in the color of the sky? And you, you never do. You always leave it white. No, well, you see, the sky. 
And I just use the example of the sky as a, as, as a way of illustrating this point about you leaving the whites. The sky in this, this is Amsterdam. This is the last one I did um, last summer, just after the symposium. So the sky is this white space here. So it's that negative, negative space across the top. And if I painted it, so I painted it a cobalt blue or an ultramarine or whatever, whatever it was, it would just take away from all of this. It would take away from the actual content itself. So it, in a sense, psych subconsciously, I'm thinking my paper, my page is the sky. So in reality, when you look at what, you, what you're drawing, the content, the stuff that you're drawing, it sits in front of the space behind it. So the space behind my subject is my piece of paper. So right. the sky's already there. All I have to do is draw the rest of it. And once I've drawn the rest of it, the sky's there. Yeah. So you you're, you're giving yourself permission to, um, to use whatever colors you feel like to paint these um, buildings, right? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, there, there are no rules to this kind of thing. You know, you're outside, you've invested all your time, energy and effort to be there on location. So, you know, you have complete control over what you do. But going back to Jennifer's point about the use of space, the, the space kind of frames the picture. So all these white gaps here are just as important as the real kind of intense areas in the middle. Because if everything was populated with the same level of detail as this, it would flatten it, it wouldn't be as visually interesting, you wouldn't be able to take your eye around the page. So some parts are really quite excessive with detail. And then other parts, as you go towards the edges, you leave that white space. But this white space here is just as important for the overall picture as this bit of detail here. And this white space here is just as important is that building is every part is just leading the eye around the page all the time. So that's a Bridget, big part of location. Bridget is asking, what about the space for the windows on a building when you lay down your wash? Right, okay. So on this one again, a bar it. When I'm painting the facade of this building here, I might kind of like draw in paints all around those edges so the actual shape of the window is kind of left blank and then obviously once it's dry you can then draw the frame around the outside and the curtains hanging and all, you know all the kind of the bars and everything like that so when you're painting around these shapes here in color you can actually kind of mark out the spaces where the windows are going to go and that's just observation you know that's just using a paintbrush like you would use a pen that's all you're doing, just looking at what's in front of you, recording it in paint. But most of the time, I've kind of marked it out in pen first anyway. Yeah. You know, probably using the brush pen. So I've marked things out with the brush pen first. I noticed that you often use a, a dark black to fill in the windows, the window spaces. And yeah. I realized because exactly. you, you have like a strong dark black contrast in a lot of your uh, sketches yeah. because you're a big line guy. Yeah, so. This little thing, this little guy here, is just perfect for that. And that's a Tombow. This is the Tombow. Mm -hmm. So the Tombows, they're just brush pens, but these are, these are dual tipped. So you've got your brush part here, and you've got your fine liner part here. So what I often do is when I'm starting one of my pictures, I'll sketch it out first with the brush pen. And I hold it, right at the very edge like that and I just find I've got so much more control when I'm holding yes. it at the very So your very hand is edge. not leaning on the paper? No, not, not at this stage, no, no. And I've just got so much more control doing it that way. Okay. And so your hand is, I, I'm picturing that your hand is leaning on the paper at the very final stage when you're doing that, yes. so you're smashing in the detail. Yeah, so this, this is stage one. So there's kind of five parts to the way I, I work. So stage one is you're sketching it all out. So I mean, obviously I wouldn't sketch that out. Because <laughs> I've never seen anything like that on location. This is, this is in my head. This is how I'm feeling at the moment, okay? This is like, this is like three months of isolation and your head's about to go ping. But basically, <laughs> if I was working on location, I'd be sketching out first with the brush pens, okay? Not, not so much the black one. I'd probably use like a kind of mid, a mid-tone one, 
I mean, for anybody who wants to know, this is N, N79, and it's kind of a mid-tone, it's a kind of warm, sepia stroke grey kind of colour. I'll just show, show what it looks like. It's kind of, it's this baby here, okay? It's that guy. And I'd probably sketch things out with this one, first of all. Then I'd go over it with the fine liner. So the fine liners are kind of like 0.05, or to say 0.8. So, and these are great because obviously you can then start working in, you know, more specific kind of lines, more specific bits of bits of detail. But I'd still hold these right at the very top. I still kind of hold them like that so my hand does not go on the page. Then I whack the paint on, okay, slap a bit of paint on, use the pastry brush and the riggers and just, just have fun really, you know, just go a bit crazy with that, especially at the moment. Um, and then I use the brush pens again but this time I use the brushy part and that kind of tweaks the colours, it calms it all down, it adds depth, it adds a more kind of three-dimensional aspect to it. And then the final stage, which takes up most of the time, although it's the fifth stage, it kind of takes up probably the last hour and a half of any session, is I use the fine liners again, but this time I'm kind of holding my, my hand, the edge, edge of my hand, on the page and then I'm doing all the kind of cross hatching techniques and doing all the kind of details. So this is a much more kind of precise, more controlled type of drawing. So rather than holding it like that, I'm bringing my hand much further, much further down now and I've got a lot more control over it. But you still have to be quite careful because if part of your picture is still wet and you've got your hand on, it just goes, it just like spreads across. And then right. before you, you've got a dog's dinner instead of a, an urban sketch. Well, we don't want a dog's dinner. So, Ian, <laughs> what, is, uh, what is your brand of uh, fine liner that you're using there? People are asking. The, these ones, these are, these, are, these are Derwins. These are made by, by Derwins, Derwin line makers. And they do a range from 0.05, and then there's a 0.1, a 0.2, a 0.3, a 0.5, and a 0.8. You get six of them in a pack. And these are great, but I also use Pilot, I use Stadler, I use Faber Castell, and they all kind of do the same job. They're all basically fine lines. But what I also use as well as these are these guys. And these are called Mitsubishi Uniballs, which sounds like it should be something far better than a pen. It should be like a bloody aeroplane or something like that, but it's not, <laughs> it's a pen. It's called a Mitsubishi Uniball, which is quite pretentious really. But these are rollerball ones, and these guys, are, these are like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of pens, because these can just roll across anything. So you get that, that could be like a ploughed field, and this guy would still go across, and you know, nothing gets in his way. And these are really tough. And they also have quite a really intense level of black as well. And they're really tough, and they like last forever. I think I bought this one when I was 12, and I've still got it. Yeah, it wasn't really Oh, that's fantastic. So there's a couple other questions here. And while you're thinking about it, I'm going to switch over and share my screen and show one of your sketches up close and you can talk about that after. So a couple okay. of questions. Trent is asking, do you ever use a fountain pen? And no. uh, Roz is asking, is the Mitsubishi permanent ink? And Dean Osella is asking, your paper preference to hold up to all those different mediums you use? Okay, I'll go through those one at a time then. So the first one was the fountain pen. Mm -hmm. Never, never use a fountain pen um, because I just don't like them. I've tried them and, and I don't like the fact that they potentially run out and I don't like the nib. I just quite like the, the, the feel of the fine liners. Um, so no, I, ne I never use fountain pens. And then the other question was to do with the Mitsubishi being waterproof. No, it's not, it's water soluble. So you have to be careful with that. All the other ones, Pilot, Stadler, they're all permanent. So once you've given them like, you know, 10 seconds to dry, you can slap as much water on them as you can. You can go swimming with them and it will be fine. And the paper will be ruined, it's being quite rough. So, you know, they're absolutely fine, but the Mitsubishi's are not, they are water soluble. So you've got to be careful that you don't kind of use them right till the very end. Because if you do put water on top, they'll, they'll just smudge. And some people quite like that. I know people who use the Mitsubishis and then they put water on top and it gives them a, a certain kind of technique 
certain finish, but I, I, I just don't, I don't like that. And okay. then the other question was the paper. Paper. The paper. What's that pad you're holding up? Right, I'll show you, see if I've got one with the cover. Trouble is all the covers get, get ripped off. Right, so this, this pad here, this one, this is my Amsterdam sketchbook here. Okay, can you see it? Can you see yes. that? Well, here, let me stop sharing. Right, so yeah. these, this is, this is Fabriano, hot press, 140, 140 pounds. That's weight, not, not price, it's about 30 pounds. Um, and they have 25 sheets. It's uh, A3, so it's 40 centimeters by 30. Um, and I go through loads of these. Um, I've, I've, I've bought like loads of them over the years. And I, I always take these guys away from me, with me. And the reason I use them is it's hot press. So it's it's not the easiest to paint on, but I like it because I like how the colors sit together on the, on, the, on, the, on the surface. I mean, you can use like a kind of knot finish or a, a rough finish and, and it's probably easier to paint, but it's going to wreck your pens. And because this is smooth, it just allows your pens just to slide across. So it's just like drawing on the, on, on the best kind of paper you can in terms of, you know, allowing the, 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 the pen work to really glide across so you can draw quite fluently. But also, I, I, I just like how the colours, the, the water sits. But it is, a, it is a bit tricky if you've not used it before because it's, because it's hot press. I'll just show you this one. This is the last Amsterdam one I did. I mean, like lots of, there's lots of line work in this one. This is one of those like amazing swing bridges. And you can just see there's loads of line work, all these kind of like wires and, and all these chains that all kind of link together. And then as it goes down, you've got all these amazing cracks and pavements and things like that. And if this was like a hot press finish, you just could not get all this line work. You wouldn't get a continuous line. It would just be broken all the time and it yeah. wreck your pens. And also it would, take, it would take a long time. It's physically harder to do. So because it's super smooth, it's just great for the lines, but also the colours just sit beautifully and they mix so nicely together. So yeah, um, nice. yeah so the Fabriano is great. I love it. Love I have it. a couple of other questions here for you, Ian. Um, so, but I'm going to ask you the questions, then I'm going to go and uh, put the screen on a couple of your sketches so people can see it up close. So the questions are from Pat: Do you go back in uh, in with color or paint after you add brick yeah. and details? And the color yeah. from question from Judy: Hi, Judy. Yeah. Judy from New Orleans. She hi, asked, Judy. Yeah, hi, Judy. Hi, buddy. She says, you can also get Fabriano Artistic in sheets to make your own sketchbook. It's wonderful. And that's what she uses. Um, and uh, Catherine asks, Tombow pens are not waterproof. Do you use them only on top of your paint? Right, okay. But do that last question first. The, right, so the, these, these are not waterproof. You're absolutely right. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, it's, it, so if you look at the one on the screen at the moment, that was the first one that I drew when I went to New Orleans. That was my kind of warm up sketch. So a lot of the brush pen work would have been done on top of the watercolor. But what's great about the fact that they're water soluble and they're water based as opposed to say alcohol based, is if the paint hasn't quite fully dried, let's say it's 95% dry, so it's a little bit damp. When you draw with these on top, what will happen is say it's a light grey and you've got like a, a yellow wash and the yellow wash hasn't completely dried. It will pick up the water, the water solubleness of this, if there's such a word as that, is it will pick up some of the yellow and it'll start pushing it around so the two will kind of activate together, which I really like. It takes a bit of getting used to. Um, so the water solubleness of this is, is I, I find a real asset because you can draw on top of the colour before the colour is completely dried and the two will kind of mix together. Now if it is completely dry, let's say you leave it another say 10 minutes and it's completely dry, you then get a layering effect. So you'll get the grey on top of the yellow. They won't mix together. So you've got both, you've kind of got the best of both worlds. If you put it on too soon, and it's completely wet, then your pen stops working. <laughs> so you've got to be careful. You've got to time it just right, really. Um, but because I'm working outside, and obviously there's a lot of kind of time factors involved, because either the weather, the weather's like bloody freezing, and I've got to get, you know, got to get in, inside quickly, or I'm doing a workshop. Um, 
the fact that these guys will work on top of kind of dampish paint is, is a real asset because it means you're not waiting for it to completely completely dry. So if you look at the one on the screen, the one of Bari, that lovely little square in Bari, a lot of the brush pen work has gone on top of the buildings while the buildings were still slightly damp. And I like that because it enables you to push to push the paint around. But you've got you've got to, you've just got to practice that that element really. You you can't just you know take my word for it. You just have to have a little go and experiment yourself. But I, I love these pens. These pens are just great because they just link in so well with, with the painting side and the line work. Now, if you look at the one that I did yesterday, um, this is my social distancing urban sketching going around the house. All the tiles, all those parquet tiling at the, at the bottom there, that's a mixture of, of paint. Some of them are individually painted. They had washes on first and then some are individually painted. But if you look at the ones towards the bottom that are nearest to you, that's just done with the brush pen. And, and some, sometimes I would have drawn with the brush pen on top of the parquet flooring before, before it was completely dry. <laughs> Sounds like a bond, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, so there was another question there somewhere, wasn't it? I forgot what it was. Um, uh, I'm gonna have to stop sharing to see Did if you, there's any more questions. Judy asked a question. Did Judy she made ask a, one? She made a comment. It wasn't really oh, a question. I hope it was nice. Um, Um, so one thing that somebody asked, I'm not quite sure what it means, but um, somebody asked uh, Tombow Pens, no, wait a minute, somebody asked, uh, she's heard that Tombow Pens are fugitive. Is, isn't that an issue in making art for sale? Now, I don't know what that means exactly. It, it means that they're not great in terms of light fastness, which means they will eventually fade. Um, which I suppose, you know, is just one of those things. And, you know, if, you, if you're bothered about that, then people are going to be bothered about it. I mean, I, I've been using them for about five years and I've never seen any signs of them fading. But then you see, I use them as part and parcel of other things as well. So probably if they, mine did fade, the colours would become brighter. <laughs> so they might, yeah. they might improve in time. I mean, the thing is, they, they might fade eventually. I mean, if you did, I think if you did a whole picture just using them and then you, you hung them up, on the wall and direct in direct sunlight it might become an issue but you see to show you this one this is amsterdam again this is the amsterdam sketch right this 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 guy here has had a little bit of brush pen work done but it's not it's not a huge big part of it and often they're used to kind of sketch things out so all the kind of initial lines are sketched out and then it's gone over with pen and then it's gone over with paint and then it's gone over with brush pen again so it just becomes kind of integral into the whole thing. The only place where it kind of sits on its own is that area there and that area there. And it's not really a big deal in that area down there. So, but if it, if it bothers people, then, you know, don't, don't use them. But I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy with them. Yeah. But most of my work anyway, um, I mean, I sell a lot of my originals, but I get a lot of my work published into prints. And obviously once they're printed up, they're not going to go anywhere, are they? They're not going to fade at all. No. So uh, there's one more question. And just to let you know, we have 10 minutes left in this call. And then this call will end automatically. Nothing I can do about it. So um, uh, Laura asks, uh, she says, Hi, Ian. How do you decide where to place the solid black areas when shading? The little pops of black seem to be a hallmark of urban sketching and really mm. add to the 3D effect. I think it's a okay. hallmark of Ian, though those little black. Really great, great question. Okay, this is Pompeii. This is a workshop um, demonstration piece that I did last summer. Um, and the little pops of black, well, you can see, you can kind of see them pinging all the way around. And it's it's almost like you, you kind of, you're scanning, you, you, you kind of scan the scene and you find something which is a pop of black. So it could have been, for example, just those kind of little curly bits there on the columns, okay? This is the, this is the extent of my technical talking now, I'm not an architect. So these little <laughs> curly bits around there, okay? So that little pop of black, that was a really strong shadow that was coming across. And we were trying to, we were trying to channel Salvador Dali in this. This was like urban sketching and surrealism. So that little tiny ping of black there, probably then informed me that I need to ping it elsewhere. So you've almost got like this 
mindfulness of, of, of a deep dark black and then you go scanning the scene in front of you to find it in other places and then once you start seeing them they kind of knit the scene they knit the picture together so these columns here which we kind of turned into you know corn on the cob they look like corn on the cobs so they've got loads of them in there and these were just the little shadows and then it pinged across to this kind of tile work here and then it pinged up to the little shadow and it pinged up to the dark exaggerated shadow down there which again is like kind of Salvador Dali. So yeah, those little pings of black, and they're on, they're on, I'll show you another one here around the sedan. They're kind of, they're kind of everywhere on this one. So in the windows, you can see the little pings of black and the little gaps here, and then the wheels of the bike, and look at the top there, to so down there, over there. And what that starts doing is it knits the picture together. So when you finish the painting side, you know, it's all kind of chaotic and it's all over the place. It looks like a dog's bum. But then when you start the drawing and you start channeling all the different tones using the brush pens, it starts knitting it together. It starts tightening it all up again. And I like that. I like going from chaos to order and then back to, to chaos again. Because somebody did ask a question before about, do I paint afterwards? And I do, I'll probably throw a bit more paint on towards the end as well. If you feel like it's getting a bit too neat and tidy, I'll whack a bit more paint on just to, yeah. make, it, to make it more chaotic again. <laughs> so uh, everyone, I'm really excited to tell you that we are in the very final stages of editing an online uh, workshop that Ian and I filmed in New Orleans last November. And I'm hoping maybe even today, actually, which is a, just a coincidence um, that I'm talking to Ian, but um, maybe even today that that uh, video will be complete and ready to be launched. So please uh, check back to the Studio 56 um, Facebook page. This is the sketch that Ian worked on for like two or three hours, three or four hours <laughs> mm -hmm. in New Orleans. And so um, if uh, you really don't want to miss out on, on this, because Ian's going to talk about the five stages that he goes through in his process from initially sitting down on the stool to that finished product that you just saw right there um, and so if, if you really are excited to take the workshop email me at studio 56 at gmail.com um, and so that that's going to be coming out really soon i have only six minutes left um, people it's going to be okay i just want to encourage everyone right in it's going to be okay things might be rough right now but um, make your art Think positive thoughts, stay inside and quarantine, but go for walks once in a while by yourself and stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. Ian, do you have any final words for people? Yeah, so what what I, I'd just like to echo that as well, because we're all in the same boat. It's not like it's happening to one country. Well, it started off, obviously, it was all for what happened in China. Then it spread to Italy and now it's worldwide and we're all in the same situation, but we'll all pull through it together. And just you know, imagine the parties and the celebrations that we're going to have yeah. when we come through this. Whether it's going to yeah. be the end of this year or, or next or next year, and I, I just can't wait to get out drawing again and, and meeting people. Because obviously, I'm I'm spending a bit of time inside at the moment, and I'm doing all these kind of interiors and stuff. But I'll probably do that for about another week, and then I'm, I'm going to go off by myself and just find some really nice little remote parts of the area where I live, um, and just draw by myself and just kind of keep it ticking over. But it's great to share work and see what the people are doing and there's loads of like new like judy set up a, a web um, a facebook page and she sharing your art from home which is brilliant so thanks for that judy thank um, you judy. and like all those sort of things it's great to see what people are people are doing um, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll, we'll come through it you know yeah. and somebody said something which i'd just like to mention because it, 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 it kind of really resonated with me and someone was saying something on the radio about how there's so many things happening now that we cannot affect you know, there's so many big things going on, but what we can do and the things that matter are the things that we can change ourselves, you know, in our own little personal dealings. And that's things like looking out for each other, you know, keeping your distance, you know, not socializing unnecessarily. Um, and, you know, just, just keeping, keeping it all going, keeping other people going, you know, just spreading, you know, good, good messages. And that, that's all we can do. We can only affect things that we're able to, to affect and, and the rest of it will just you know we I can't I can't create a vaccine you know I can't I can't make the airlines take me off to to Texas I can't do any of that it's just completely beyond me but I can make art still and I can share art and you know 
hopefully show show people what I do and, and, if, and if it helps them and encourages them well that, that's all I'm able to do yeah. yeah thank you so much Ian everyone um, I'm going to continue with these live stream chats and uh, I will probably have one in the next couple of days it isn't posted yet but I know I'm going to be talking with Stephanie Bauer uh, who's going to be talking about watercolor and her art I'm going to be talking with Mike Dakibara who will also be uh, talking about sketch now think later and I'm going to be talking to Christina Wald from Cincinnati who is a children's book illustrator so please check back to the Studio 56 Facebook page and we have only a couple of minutes left before we get uh, <laughs> get cut off. Also take some online courses. Studio 56 has one up already with Oliver Huller called, uh, called Design on the Fly and that's available through the studio56boutique.com and uh, Ian's is going to be published maybe today, maybe today, Layers oh, of Looking. Right. In which he will um, he will be going through the five steps and answering a lot of the questions that questions that we missed today. You're going to see the answers for those questions in his online workshop. How long, how long have we got? Two minutes. Right. Let me just quickly explain why we chose this subject. Okay. okay. This is this is the one but the, the online course. Okay. This is the subject for it. We chose this because it's it's got everything to do with New Orleans. So when I went there, it's got all the elements. Okay, it's got the hydro pole, it's got the wires, it's got the architecture, the one-way sign, the hand, the hand that says don't walk. We don't get any of this in the UK. So I think this is one of the great things about urban sketching. It helps you to notice the world around you. One and when minute. you see things that are different from what you're used to seeing, it's just fascinating because it's a way of just discovering and sharing the world and that's what it's all about and that's why I chose that subject and that's why I do what I do it just helps me to discover the world and the people and the places and the culture yeah, yeah. it's great it's magic yeah. great well uh, I hope to see all of you online at our next uh, call Ian is uh, Ian and I have uh, postponed our March, April, uh, San Antonio workshop for next November, and we have a few spots available. You can check that out at the studio56boutique.com website, and hopefully that is a go. We'll see how things go. <clears throat> anyway, We're going to be doing so many things next year, guys. There'll be so much stuff. Everyone's going to be desperate for it. Everyone's going to be wanting to get out and draw and paint and get back again, so it'll be great.